Yeah, thanks so much, Michael, and to all the other organizers. Um, I'm very happy to have the chance to speak here about my work with uh, Steiner and Kayudin on, as you said, the soup norm problem and the level aspect. So we'll begin by recalling some background on the soup norm problem. So just to keep things rather concrete, we'll take M to be a compact Riemannian surface, and then we'll let phi be an L2 normalized Laplace eigenfunction on that surface. And we'll think about what happens when the eigenvalue tends to infinity. So this is a problem in uh, quantum chaos or semi-classical analysis of understanding how big the size of such eigenfunctions can be. So there's, there's something called the local bound um, due to Horminder and Saga that just takes into account how the eigenfunction behaves in small open subsets of the manifold, which tells you that it's bounded by t to the half, where t again is something like the square root of the eigenvalue. And one way you can think of that, that proof, um, there are a few perspectives on it you could take, is that one can understand averages like I've indicated here, where you take t in a window of size a bit bigger than one, uh, of the squares of these values rigorously, you can prove asymptotic formulas for them that um, tell you they're of size roughly t. And if you drop all but one term in an asymptotic formula like this, then you recover the bound I've indicated here point-wise. So um, yeah, so this, this bound is sharp in, in some situations. So for example, on the two-sphere, uh, you, you have eigenspaces where all but one of the elements will vanish at the North Pole. And for those examples, only one thing contributes here. So it has to be as big as the bound suggests it could be. Uh, but there are some cases, for example, when M is uh, negatively curved or hyperbolic, where it's expected that these, these, these bounds can be improved. But you know, since this is a number theory seminar, um, we come to the corrupts, which is that the improvements have been made in a significant way, meaning in the exponent rather than just a logarithmic factor. Uh, only when the manifold is, is is an arithmetic manifold and when the eigenfunction phi is uh, also arithmetic in the sense that it's a heck of eigenform. So th 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 there's a pioneering result in uh, the subject going back almost 30 years now due to Invaniach and Sarnak. So what they consider is, for example, the modular surface that I'll call M, which is what you get by quotienting the upper half plane by the modular group. And they take phi to be uh, a, a cuspidal Hecke eigenform. So it'll continue to be a, a Laplace eigenfunction in the sense of the previous slide, but it'll, it'll now satisfy um, an eigenfunction condition under the Hecke operators. So this, this in particular tells you that you can actually determine phi up to a scalar by um, the eigenvalues that we know about it. So it kind of throws out the multiplicity issue that um, causes problems when you try to understand the soup norm problem more generally. And so assuming these conditions, they managed to show the following improvement where you replace the exponent one half by something a bit smaller, something smaller by the fraction one twelfth, up to something that we can take shrinking as t grows to infinity. So uh, their result and their method kind of kickstarted the whole industry. I mean, I think the last time I checked, there were some, there's somewhere on the order of magnitude of 100 papers that have cited this and built upon it in various ways. So for example, people have um, generalized it to the level aspect, the subject of the talk, where you don't vary the manifold, you don't vary the eigenvalue, but you instead vary the underlying manifold and you try to understand what happens there. Um, many people have generalized these results to other spaces, such as other quotients of more general groups by arithmetic groups. And there are also many results where people not, don't just bound values of um, eigenfunctions at points, but instead Integrals of eigenfunctions over submanifolds, for example. So it would it would be kind of impossible for me to summarize, but there are lots of papers that have generalized this in many ways. So this talk will be specifically about the level aspect of the problem, which we'll kind of say what we mean by in a bit more detail in a second. But the methodology will kind of play a big role um, in the talk. So I want to kind of pause to explain in some broad strokes, what their argument actually was and what that argument as a prototype people have generalized, and then indicate very briefly how we're gonna, gonna kind of depart from that before we go into the details of what the results are. So the argument in a nutshell considers what, um, what we now call amplify second moments, which are expressions kind of like what we had on the first slide where we had a sum over phi with 
parameter in some window of size roughly one of the squares of its values, but with an additional weight factor introduced here that, um, that are called amplifiers following the work of Ivanich and Duke Freeland or Ivanich and then Ivanich Sarnak. And the, the idea here is that the, the coefficients CL are maybe real numbers between negative one and one that can be chosen to kind of conspire with the signs of the eigenvalues of a specific eigenfunction phi that one cares about. And the idea here is that if one can prove an asymptotic formula for an expression like this, much like one could when there wasn't any amplifier, then one has the hope of kind of choosing these signs in a way that conspire to amplify the contribution of a given fee at the expense of some other fees. And so then the asymptotic formula by um, kind of dropping all but one term in this expression would then give a better than trivial bound for the values of that eigenfunction. So to actually make this kind of argument work, one needs a few inputs. So, so one, for example, one needs to know that these eigenvalues, the heck eigenvalues are not all zero for L in the range under consideration. And one needs that in a quantitative form. One needs to know that they're kind of all pretty big. And there's, there's a trick that's now standard in the subject going back to some of these pioneering works and application that I mentioned, which is to make use of the heck of multiplicativity that relates the values of the eigenvalues at a prime and, and the square of that prime. So this, so this identity shows that like you can't have both of them being too small. And, and then it gives kind of a source of examples of Hecke eigenvalues that are provably bounded away from zero. So that's kind of the main leverage one has to show that these things can be made large. So then, okay, you can make the amplifier large. You're gonna need to actually bound this expression. And this is something you do kind of using, um, well, you, using what's called the pretrace formula that I've written down here, where, um, so things like on the left-hand side are what you get by, say, majorizing the condition on T by some weight function H that maybe is smooth and big on this interval and pretty small otherwise. And then uh, expanding the square here and using Hecke multiplicativity to collapse the Hecke eigenvalues multiplied together into individual Hecke eigenvalues. So the right-hand side is, is what's called the geometric side of the pretrace formula, which involves an integral transform K defined in terms of H, and then a sum over two by two integral matrices of given determinant, the number N that you're taking the eigenvalue for here. And then K you evaluate on something like the distance between where gamma moves the point Z that you're evaluating and Z itself. So, there's, there's kind of some analytic problem of estimating K in terms of H, and then there's some diophanting problem of actually estimating how the various gamma contribute here. So for instance, one needs to understand how many gamma have a given determinant and have distance in this sense at most delta for, for various ranges of delta that we should think of as being pretty close to zero. So these, these are the problems that they kind of introduced and then solved in their, in their paper. And um, what can we say about this? Yeah, I guess, I guess the main thing is that, um, so their paper's you know, 30 years old and somehow no one's managed to improve this exponent uh, since then. So it kind of seems like um, you know, one runs into a wall here. There isn't, there, there, people have thought about this. There doesn't seem to be so much room to um, improve here. But there's a good bit of inefficiency actually that comes from having to impose this condition here. So if we knew something a bit more robust about these eigenvalues, like if we knew that they were all, or if, if they were, if we knew they were typically bounded away from zero or something like that, then Avonish and Sarnik even remarked that they could then improve their exponent um, quite a bit. But we don't know how to do that. So it's kind of an open question to find, find any way to do better here. So um, all of these other directions that I've alluded to concerning the supernorm problem use kind of the same basic sketch. There's going to be some step where you have to make some amplifier big, some step where you write down something like a pretrace formula and do some analysis, and then some step where you got to do some kind of diophantine considerations. And uh, so this is kind of an archetype for a lot of the literature on the problem in many directions. So things changed um, a few years ago when one of my co-authors, Raphael Steiner, introduced a new approach to this soup norm problem in these arithmetic settings for, for surfaces, where instead of using an amplified second moment, like in the previous slide, he considered what, what would happen if you, if you try to understand just a fourth moment unamplified. 
So, so in some sense, like, I mean, the point of an amplifier is you want to kind of increase the contributions of the bad fees, the ones where the soup norm is large, so that you can prove that they don't exist. And the best possible way to do that is just to put the value of phi in there. But then the obvious question is, can you actually make sense of the asymptotics of expressions like this? Can you understand them rigorously? So he introduced a technique for doing this kind of in a, and I think what, what could be fairly described as like a test case, not directly related to many of the problems that um, people have considered previously, where he showed that you could you can rewrite this kind of fourth moment over a family of eigenfunctions as I've kind of just indicated it schematically here as something like an inner product of a pair of theta functions, which you can then maybe hope to try to estimate in some way using geometry of numbers techniques. And, and I'll go into more detail about what exactly is meant by that later in the talk. And then once you have something like this set up, you can try to estimate individual values by dropping all but one term and just using that everything is positive. So he wrote a very short paper, maybe it was six pages or something, kind of introducing this technique and applying it in some, some basic example. And a few people or, or teams of people have applied that technique in, in the inter intervening years. So first, um, the other two of my co-authors, Ilya Kayudin and Raphael Shiner, applied it to the weight aspect on arithmetic surfaces. So kind of like the Ivani Sarnak setup, but where the, where the weight is varying. And so they, they, they got a very strong bound there that, that's now the world record. Um, I guess in the non-compact case, so for example, for SL2Z, it, um, it kind of just re reproved a record that was already established by a different method. But at the very least, it kind of showed the promise of the technique to um, you know, see things differently and also to extend them to compact quotients, things that had already been known for, for non-compact quotients. So it kind of plays a, plays a role in substituting Fourier expansions in Shah's argument. And then um, I've indicated here, Blummer, Hakosh, Maga, and Milosevic recently applied this to something uh, involving hyperbolic three spaces and their quotients for something I've just kind of called the K-type aspect. And yeah, what I'll talk about today is a preprint that went up a couple months ago, I guess, uh, joint with me and uh, Kayudin and Steiner, where we apply this technique to the level aspect version of the problem. So then what I'll do in the talk is I'll, well, I'll say what I mean by level aspect, I'll state our results, and then I'll try to say something about like what we actually did, like what kind of analysis actually went into making them work. Um, and I should mention that as of now, this technique does not seem so hopeful in attacking the kind of motivating question here where you just vary the eigenvalue. So the Ivani of Sarnak problem, it seems very difficult to improve upon that or even to improve upon the trivial bound using this technique, but maybe just some, some new ideas are, are needed. Um, okay, so yeah, with that kind of uh, overview, what do we mean by the level aspect? So for, for, for the talk, I'll let n be a natural number that we'll think of as tending off to infinity. And I'll always assume that it's square free. So I guess natural numbers kind of come in two extreme classes. So they're the square free ones or maybe the primes. And then they're, they're the ones that are powers of fixed primes. So for example, two to some large power. For the latter examples, it turns out the soup norm problem is a rather different flavor that is kind of more closely aligned with the spectral and holomorphic aspects that I indicated previously. And, and there's a whole different discussion that you know many people have worked on. So it's a, in particular, Abhishek Saha and Yuki Hu have many papers going in that direction. So here, we're going to take n to be square free. You can think of it as just a prime, and you won't lose anything for the talk. And we'll let m be the quotient of the upper half plane by the standard congruent subgroup gamma naught of n. So this is a quotient whose volume grows something like n as n tends to infinity. We're going to assume, as before, that phi is, say, a Laplace eigenfunction, cuspidal, um, now defined on this varying manifold m. I'll always assume that it's, a, again, a Hecke eigenform. I'll further assume it's a, it's a new form in the sense of Atkin and Lenner. And I'll assume that the eigenvalue is kind of bounded to some fixed window. So if we kind of fix in advance some bound on the eigenvalue, and we require it to lie in that window as, as the level n varies. Um, for the sake of normalization, I'll, I'll assume now that the L2 norm squared is equal to the volume of the manifold. So what this says informally is that on average, in an L2 sense, the values of the form are one. And that's a convenient uh, normalization because it motivates what I think is the folklore conjecture, 
which says that the L infinity norm should likewise be bounded by something like one or something that grows very slowly with n. Um, and that's to be compared with the analog of the local bound that can be again proved pretty easily using a pretrace formula of n to the half. So just like in the eigenvalue aspect, we have some gap to bridge between the trivial thing where the exponent is a half and maybe the optimistic conjecture where the exponent could be say zero. So um, yeah, many people have worked on this question. So I guess Ivanir Sarnak was in 1995 and the first improvement on that, at least the publication date is 2009 by Blomer and Holowinski where they improved on the exponent by the fraction one over 37. And um, yeah, they introduced a lot of new ideas into the, into the subject. So, so in particular, unlike in the eigenvalue aspect, in, in, in this aspect, there, there are kind of much more serious Diophantine considerations that go in. So it, 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 it matters a lot whether, for example, the real part of the point that you're evaluating at is well or badly approximable by rational numbers. They give different arguments according to the two cases. Um, uh, but, but but I guess the the, the basic prototype of, type of, of of the proof. So the overall method was like an Ivania Sarnak, and that's the case for all of these results here. They all use an amplified free trace formula, but they came up with kind of better and better ideas to handle the Diophantine analysis, or perhaps to construct the amplifier, and then to do all the necessary counting. And eventually, the exponent kind of shrunk down to one sixth. Which you can think of as kind of one third of the way from the trivial bound to the optimistic bound, and it might remind you of some other natural barriers in um, in analytic number theory. So, for instance, in the subconvexity problem, a third of the way from convexity to Lindelof or the zeta function is what's called the vial bound, and that's kind of known as like a very hard bound to improve upon. I mean, many people have, but still, just by a little bit. Um, and there are many settings where something like a vial type bound is the best known, and it kind of feels like a natural um limit so okay I've, I've emphasized again all these results use this second moment um amplified approach of Avani of Sarnak improving the Diophantine analysis that, that that goes into that method so yeah so uh uh Steiner Kajudin and I tried looking at this question using the fourth moment approach and we didn't really know actually whether it would have any chance of succeeding because by then we had seen that, okay, it succeeds pretty well in the weight aspect. It seems to fail pretty miserably in the spectral aspect, the eigenvalue aspect. Level aspect for square free levels is kind of intermediary between those two aspects in, in, in certain respects. Um, so it seemed for about six months that it was definitely gonna fail, but we at least had the hope of kind of coming up with a good reason why it would fail in the level aspect that maybe we could, you know, write up and share with people and say, hey guys, you know, here's something to maybe try to find some new idea to improve upon. Then we ended up actually making it work. So that was nice. And so what we get here is uh, an, a further improvement from one sixth up to one quarter, which is exactly halfway between the trivial bound and the optimistic bound. Um, so we, we were quite surprised that this actually worked out. Um, well, well, it's a preprint. You guys can tell us if you believe that it worked out, but okay, we, we do. And um, yeah, it's kind of a rare thing. Like, I mean, for example, for the zeta function, this would be kind of like proving a bound of t to the one eighth. That's which is kind of hopelessly out of the question. So this is a situation where you apparently can prove kind of halfway like that. Um, and yeah. Um, okay, so that's the, that's the result that I'll try to um, say something about what went into the proof of in the remainder of the talk. Um, I should mention maybe a little bit about like a little bit more about why people care. So uh, I've indicated here a, a few applications um, kind of a bit, a bit internal to the subject. So for example, you can interpolate this L infinity bound with L4 bounds proved by other people to get better LP bounds in general. Um, you can make Wolton's estimate for twisted, additively twisted sums of Hecke eigenvalues quite uniform with respect to the, the level of the eigenform. Um, you can improve certain subconvexity estimates in some cases. So some people, Hao and Chen, had proved a subconvex bound in some kind of hybrid twisted case, conditional exactly on the supernorm bound that we're considering here. So just by plugging in our new exponent into their result, you get a better result in, in their setting. And then uh, one of my co-authors has applied this to, to um, improve the known bounds and the diameter of certain arithmetic hyperbolic surfaces. Um, 
Okay, so maybe that's that's it for now on uh, applications. Um, yeah, before I go any further, are there just any questions on kind of what we're doing, what the result says, anything else? I have, Peter, I have a question. Yeah. If you take the uh, uh, sort of periodic uh, quotients instead of um, this uh, continuous quotient, so you'd get a graph, and there are a lot of people in uh, who's studying the infinity norms of graphs. So I assume your results applied there and give for uh, you know these Ramanujan type graphs uh, some bound. Have you worked that out? Yeah, that's a good question. So the answer is yes, and it, it'll be it'll be in fact on the one of the slides coming up. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Uh, excuse me. Paul. Just a follow-up question. Uh, oh, sure. Does it give any bound on diameter of Ramanujan graphs? So I think what he observed is that it gives the bound that follows from Deline or Eichler or whatever, but without appealing to that. So it kind of so it recovers two times log of some so it yeah. recovers the same oh i see yeah, it, rec it recovers it but it gives a proof that doesn't need that if for example if for some reason you want that yeah nice thanks yep. uh paul i had a quick question sure um the folklore conjecture you mentioned um enter the epsilon bound <clears throat> i seem to remember that there was a paper by Templier that in some setting that's not true what was that? Do you yeah, know? so the setting would be if you, for example, you allowed non-trivial central character. So if you work with gamma one of n, then, then their examples were kind of the most optimistic thing would fail. But so um, the, was the that into the quarter that he got? That sounds, I'd have to uh, think to remember. That sounds kind of, no, I th I think it might've been bigger than that even. I think it might've been into the, uh, I, I don't want to kind of be wrong, but um that, that, that happens for kind of well understood reasons related to um, the Fourier expansion and kind of behavior near the cusp. So like one term kind of contributing to the Fourier expansion in certain in certain regions or, or something kind of of that flavor. And um, th th that just doesn't happen for the for the class for the example we're considering here. Um, for, for gamma okay. out of n with n square free that kind of thing won't happen. I just thought in case it's a quarter then I was going to uh -huh, ask, okay. are you proving the best possible in that setting. That's a good. I don't. I don't remember. That's a good question. Um, I seem to recall it being a third. Um, okay. okay. If you want another coincidence, though, so the analogous estimate over a function field was proved essentially by Will Sawin a couple of years ago, where so what he proved is that you could you could take delta to be something that tends to zero as the cardinality of the underlying finite field tends to infinity. So so at least if p is sufficiently large you get something kind of of that shape. But for each individual value of P, it seems likely that one could probably adapt our proof to the function field setting and then give a better bound there. So maybe, that, maybe that's one example where kind of the, um, you know, two, two bounds kind of match up. So, so what he gets using a lattice cohomology and all that uh, versus what we get by just averaging and yeah. Um, okay, thank you. Okay, so yeah, so I've, I've indicated already in my response to one of these questions that there, our result holds a bit more generally. And I, I mean, I would have been happy just for the sake of kind of giving an informal talk to present the proof in the case I already described with gamma not of n. But as it turns out, the proof is a bit simpler to describe for a different specialization of the general result. So I'm going to state the general result, and then I'm going to specialize it in a different way, in a way that makes the proof a bit easier to, to go through, I think, or I hope at least. So what's the, what's the more general result? So it's gonna concern a quaternion algebra over the rational numbers. So these are, these are classified up to isomorphism by their discriminant that I'll call DB, which will be some square free natural number. And a good example is if B is the algebra of two by two matrices, then DB is one. That's kind of the example relevant for what we have been talking about so far. So in this example, you can define trace and determinant maps, taking values in the rational numbers, that satisfy a bunch of natural properties. And I mean, I mean, if you don't know what quaternion algebras are, they're basically algebras that have analogous maps satisfying analogous properties. So um, they come in a, in a couple of flavors according to what happens when you extend scalars to the real numbers. So when you do that, you either get the two by two algebra of real numbers, that's called the indefinite case, or you get Hamilton's quaternion algebra, 
which is called the definite case. And in that case, the, the thing we've called determinant, which is maybe more traditionally called the reduced norm, defines a positive definite quadratic form on B. So something that looks in suitable coordinates like sum of four squares. Unlike the determinant on the two by two matrix algebra, which is a signature two, two form. So it has some kind of indefiniteness. So for, so for some arguments or for some definitions, really, it'll be easier to switch to the indefinite setting. Sorry, switch to the definite setting. So next, we're going to again let n be a square free integer tending to infinity, uh, co prime to the discriminant. We'll choose an Eichler order of level n. If you don't know what an Eichler order is, you can just focus on this example where it's kind of the, the order, meaning a, a ring of rank four, where it looks like this. So an Eichler order in general is something that kind of locally looks like this when you reduce modulo n. And then instead of our manifold hyperbolic space modulo gamma naught of n, we'll take an adelic quotient of this shape of, uh, defined using the atomization of the Eichler order and some copy of SO2. So again, if you don't know what adelic quotients are, don't worry about it, just think about this example. This is kind of the general way to reproduce that example. But then coming back to Peter's question, as, as, as Peter knows, and as many people here know, these quotients in the definite case, um, I provided you further quotient out by SO3, we'll give these finite Ramanujan graphs. Um, and so some of the eigenfunctions we consider will be eigenfunctions on those graphs, and we'll be bounding the soup norms of them. This is some kind of generalization of both certain hyperbolic surfaces and certain graphs or, or kind of more generally, I guess in the definite case, this would be a union of spheres, uh, finally many, um, which you can think of as vertices in a graph in some sense. Yeah, and if there are any questions on notation or anything uh, from anyone, just please feel free to jump in. I don't mind being interrupted as I go. Um, so, okay, we'll fix some kind of cutoff T that'll bound the eigenvalues of things involved. That'll be independent of N. We will let script F be an orthonormal basis of, again, Heckel Laplace eigenforms phi on our manifold M with parameter bounded by T. It'll be, be convenient just to kind of simplify writing to introduce the notation V for the product of these two numbers, which is, pretty close to the volume of these manifolds with respect to the natural Ramanian metric. So we'll think of V as kind of the main parameter going off to infinity. And then the main bound we'll prove is, okay, whatever point you choose on your manifold, the fourth moment of that over your family is bounded by a bit more than V. And this is kind of something you'd expect to be basically best possible. So we normalize things in the same way as before so that on average in an L2 sense, they're of size one. The family will then have size roughly V because we've kind of chosen a bounded spectral cutoff and the volume is growing like V. Um, and I've only stated here the, the main estimate we prove in the compact case. In, in the, in the non-compact case, we have some additional terms that kind of blow up as G tends towards the boundary. But near the boundary, we have other methods using just the Fourier expansion that'll give good bounds. So in all cases, we get the very clean result that the L infinity norm is bounded by the volume to the quarter. Uh, provided you have a fixed um, spectral cutoff. So in particular, in the, in the case that B is the matrix algebra, this is a, just, just this uh, congruence quotient of the upper half plane, and we get end of the quarter, like we stated earlier. Um, maybe just a minor remark. I mean, I mean, everything that I stated here works also in the weight aspect, where you don't take Laplace eigenforms, but holomorphic things. And in fact, in that aspect, we can kind of make the whole thing uniform in the weight, and we get a bound that depends on the weight like k to the fourth, which is optimal in that, or kind of best known in that respect as well. Um, in this Laplace eigenform aspect, kind of the best we can, we seem to be able to hope for is to recover the trivial bound with respect to the eigenvalue. Um, okay, so that's the result that we're going to um, present the proof of. Are there any questions on that? Uh, so improving this uh, quarter, would directly improve the diameter bound? Oh, or... that's a good question. That sounds, yeah, that sounds kind of believable. I mean, I don't know if Raphael's here and wants to answer that. I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure he's thought of it, but I think, I think the answer might be yes on that. I see. Um, so somehow it's a barrier, Risa, like, 
I keep I feeding yeah. Rick this. Uh -huh. I think so. Don't take my word on it, but you can definitely look at Raphael's uh, preprint, and I think he would he answers that. Sure. Um, Thanks. In the introduction. Yeah. Okay. So the overview of the proof. We're going to define some theta function, um, kind of in the spirit of things defined by Shimizu, that we'll call capital theta. It'll live on gamma naught of v. So gamma naught of v is the standard congruence thing um, of level the product of the discriminant and m. And it'll satisfy something like the following identity. So the fourth moment that we want to estimate will be the L2 norm of this theta function. So if we want to estimate the fourth moment here, all we got to do now, once we prove this identity, is estimate that norm of the theta function. Of course, it's not obvious that that's any easier, but it's something new to play with. So we're going to try to just get our hands dirty and understand anything about this norm of the theta function by integrating over, over Ziegle domain. So we'll say we'll recall what we mean by that. And that'll eventually reduce the problem to some counting problems um, of two types, what we'll call type one and type two. And then we'll solve the counting problems. So as it turns out, the type one counting problems will be pretty close to things that already showed up in this table of records that I had here when people you know, optimized this uh, amplified second moment approach to the pseudonorm problem. So, so, so maybe the main new ingredient will be the, the kind of type two bounds, but there will also be some new things just in the type one treatment that I'll mention. All right, but first I'll, I'll say something about where this basic identity comes from to make it um, believable. So um, it's going to come from the pretrace formula, just like the study of amplified second moments did, but in, in a slightly different way. And to present the proof as simply as possible, I want to go to the setting where the pretrace formula itself is kind of as simple as it conceivably could be. So I'm going to take B to be definite. So then this determinant form is, is positive definite. And so all of the, the fibers of that form on this order R will be finite sets. So I'll call those fibers R of N. That'll be the, the elements in our, our Eichler order with determinant N. That'll be some finite set. I'll also take the argument of the eigenfunctions, of which we bound them to be the identity element of this adult quotient. Just for notational simplicity, we can always reduce to that by conjugating things a bit. And then I'll take the cutoff to actually be zero. So what this means is that um, the kind of parameter here, the, eigen, the Laplace eigenvalue will actually be zero. So I'm considering things that are harmonic, um, which means that they're actually constants on the spheres. So we can think of them as functions on these finite sets, on these finite Ramanujan graphs. And um, so, the, so in that case, the pretrace formula has a very, very, very simple form. So the left-hand side is, is just the average of the Hecke eigenvalue weighted by the square of the value. The right-hand side is just up to normalization, the number of elements of norm n in the Eichler order. Uh, so that's quite simple. And then also the, the definition of the Shimizu theta function in this setting is, is a bit simpler because, I mean, in general, theta functions are easier to define when, you, when you're attached to them to positive definite quadratic forms than indefinite ones. For indefinite ones, you're always going to have, have, have some major in the background to introduce. So here, it's just kind of a standard theta function, like in the first course in modular forms, where the coefficients are the number of elements that determine n in the Eichler order. So this will define a modular form of weight 2 on gamma naught of v. Um, and so the identity will come down to relating the pretrace formula to the Shimizu theta function. And you can kind of see the relation right away. I mean. The first is the Fourier coefficient of the second. And by upgrading this a little bit, we'll get the basic identity. So let's just see how that goes real quick. So we need one, one more ingredient to explain it, which is the notion of Jacke Langlands or Eichler Shimizu lifts of our eigenfunctions phi. So these are, these are modular forms now on gamma naught of v that you get by just taking the series expansion attached to the Hecke eigenvalues of your given form. So it's kind of a, a theorem proved by the authors indicated above using a comparison of trace formulas that this actually defines a modular form. Um, and moreover, that any two modular forms you get in this way are orthogonal to each other. So this is, um, this is one of the ways that the multiplicity one theorem for these compact quotients can be proved. So we're going to use that in the following very serious way, the orthogonality of the Jackie Langlands lifts attached to our forms. 
So they're, they're basically orthogonal. And then the inner product is roughly the volume of, or the co-volume of that, of that group, which is something like V. It's, it's given more precisely by an adjoint L value whose size is known to be pretty close to one. All right, so that's where we've used the multiplicity one and we've defined these Jacques Langlands lifts. So there's a basic lemma one can now write down, which says that this Shimizu theta function can be written as a weighted sum of these Jacques Langlands lifts, where the weights are kind of the numbers that we actually want to bound at the end of the day. And the proof is very simple. You take the pretrace formula, you multiply it by E of NZ, and then you sum over N. So I've written down the pretrace formula here. I've multiplied it by E of NZ on both sides, and then I've summed over N. On the right-hand side, we get these Jacques Langlands lifts. On the left-hand side, we get this Shimizu theta function, and so then the lemma pops out. So now finally, if you take this lemma, you can use it to try to compute the inner product of theta against itself. You, you expand that first as a double sum over forms in your family of these inner products. But we already mentioned that these inner products detect kind of the diagonal condition. And so then you end up just getting basically this fourth moment of values of the things that you're interested in, up to some normalizing factors. So that's the basic identity. So you see that we've kind of used the, the pretrace formula and the multiplicity one theorem in, in a very serious way here. Um, and after all that, the whole point of, or, or, or what remains is just to, to prove this bound for this L2 norm of the state of function. So are there any questions on, on that? I, I imagine this was kind of fast, but I hope it maybe just gave a flavor for like what actually goes into the argument, um, what the inputs are. And so if there are no questions, I mean, kind of where we're going now is we're gonna reduce this kind of probably abstract seeming thing to some concrete counting problem, which we'll then talk about in the rest of the talk. So, so one very, very minor caution is that as I've written it, these integrals are actually infinite because there's a, there's a non-cuspidal contribution that I haven't indicated in each of these steps. So one can either regularize things by subtracting that contribution, or one can work with differences between two different values and study sums like this instead. And these sums are adequate for proving fourth, these, these fourth moment bounds. So I'm not gonna, I'm just gonna kind of ignore this technicality um, going on. And what I'll explain now is how to actually, how we actually try to bound these expressions. So theta is on some quotient like H mod gamma naught of V. And that quotient, so I, I copied from, I think Diamond and Sherman's book via Math Stack Exchange, the following image of a fundamental domain for that quotient. So you got some part near infinity and then a, a bunch of parts near zero. And you want to estimate the integral of this thing over that whole domain. So the way you do it is you kind of, you know, I guess for the part near infinity, you cover it by what's called a Ziegel domain, this thing that I drew a picture of here in red, which has the advantage that when you integrate along the horizontal contours, you can use, use Parseval's identity to simplify the integral quite a bit and express it directly in terms of the Fourier coefficients of theta. And then you need to do something similar for all these other regions near the cusp um, zero. And you can understand how theta looks there by using, for example, Poisson summation to work out its Fourier expansion there. So it turns out that if you kind of try doing this naively, okay, you, you'll reduce some counting problems, but they turn out to be kind of, um, at least as far as um, me and my collaborators are concerned, uh, very difficult. So we couldn't see any way to, to broach them. Um, so it turned out that like the, the contribution from this part of the fundamental domain near infinity was, quite easy to bound, but the remaining ones were quite difficult. So what we needed to do to make things work was to kind of balance out the fundamental domains in a way that makes this, this part a bit harder and these parts a bit easier. And at the end of the day, we found a pretty efficient way to do that, which is just to take this standard covering by little fundamental domains for SL2Z and apply the Fricka involution to it. And then after having done that, apply Ziegel domains to the parts of the cover that we get and then unfolding this integral by integrating, integrating along each of those. So that was one of these, um, that, that was maybe one kind of, at least relative to our ignorance, like one novelty in our argument. And I, I don't wanna kind of bore you with like ways that one can go wrong in trying to prove this theorem, but okay, once one has that idea, uh, which, which, which turns out we believe to be on the right track, the problem reduces to counting estimates. 
So the counting estimates are, for example, of this flavor. So these numbers R of n you'll recognize as the Fourier coefficients of theta. So it shouldn't be too surprising that they show up in the estimates that we need when we try to unfold an integral like that. And we need to know, for example, that the sum over n up to x squared of the square of the number of elements in our Eichler order of determinant n is bounded by maybe a bit more than x squared. So this notation will mean maybe up to some v to the epsilon coefficient. And we need this in a range for x going up to about the square root of the volume. So um, yeah, I'll try to give a little bit of a sense of like why this is not like a completely trivial problem after giving a preliminary reduction of it. So the preliminary reduction is that, so, so these orders, they have a kind of boring part, which is the part given by the integer z. And the orthogonal of that boring part is the traceless part that I'll call r0. So it's the elements in the order of um, trace zero. And this direct sum is pretty close up to some factor of two, let's say, to the order itself. So pretty much any counting problem involving an, an, an order r can be reduced to a counting problem involving the traceless part, which is the more interesting part. And so when you actually try you know, breaking up this sum, which is counting pairs of elements of r in terms of now quadruples of elements where two of them are in z and two of them are in r0, there, there's a pretty straightforward way to use the divisor bound to reduce this kind of estimate um, using this kind of using this kind of inequality to estimates that now just involve the traceless part of the echo. So sigma one is a first moment of cardinalities in this cycle order, and sigma two is a second moment. So these are what, what we call type one and type two estimates. We need to show that each of these are bounded basically by about x. I mean, just to, just to think for a second about what that what is what is that actually saying? So the number of numbers n up to x squared is roughly x squared. And each of these cardinalities are integers. So we're trying to show basically that at most roughly x of these cardinalities are non-zero in the first place. And whenever they're non-zero, they're bounded by basically one. And if you think, if you think about what a first and second moment bound together like this are kind of saying, that's, that's more or less the content. Um, so there's not a lot of room to kind of prove a bound like that uh, if you mess up a little bit as you try. So um, I guess we could get by in the non-compact case a bit more simply for both of these problems by using very explicit analysis of coordinates. But to get this, um, this bound in the generality, we have it where it, it works in the, in the compact setting where you don't have quite natural coordinates in your Eichel orders. And where actually you can, you can even vary the underlying quaternion algebra so the discriminant can vary freely. Um, we didn't see too many ways to do this other than the kind of systematic way that we eventually found. So um, for the type one estimates, I've already mentioned that like these were basically treated in existing literature on the soup norm problem via arithmetic amplification. So Blomer and Michelle wrote a, wrote a paper proving this delta equal one sixth estimate in the definite quaternion algebra case where they proved this, this bound for the type one estimates or well, well, they implicitly prove something like this. Um, which is adequate in the range that we need it. Um, and it's a proof using things like Min Minkowski theory and some kind of explicit um, estimates for the successive minima of our Eichler order equipped with the determinant form. So uh, the, the only novel thing that we do related to type one estimates is that we give analogous estimates in the indefinite case, which um, I guess could have been could be used retroactively to prove the one sixth bound in the compact indefinite case, which hadn't been done, apparently. Um, and I, I mean, I mean, there, there the statement is just that kind of the same bound holds if you replace the determinant by any measuring for it. So we, we put some work into formula, even just into formulating kind of what the replacement is, and then we adapted the argument. Here. So those are the type one estimates. So it remains to kind of treat these type two estimates, which I'll try to give some flavor for. So the first, op the first observation is that the type one estimate follows from the type two estimate, assuming you can prove the following thing that I call a fiber bound, which is just that for all n in the relevant range, these numbers are basically bounded by one. So maybe bounded by v to the epsilon. That's what I mean by this notation, right? Because then, you know, the type two estimate is the second moment 
But if, if we bounded all of them individually by roughly one, then we can reduce that to the first moment. And then that gives an adequate bound. So um, yeah, I guess the main, the, the main thing, the most difficult point was just to find a way to prove this individual bound, show that for any n up to roughly the volume, the number of trace zero elements in our Eichler order of norm n is basically bounded by one. So if you want a really stupidly simple example of what this estimate means in a, in a case where you can't really see what's going on, but just to give some flavor. So th the whole subtlety here is really that, that the Eichler order R is actually varying. Um, it depends upon the discriminant. It depends upon the level n. But maybe we, if, we, if we took R to be the Hamilton integral quaternions for simplicity, this will be saying that if you, if you look at integral points in three space, you just look at Z3 in the standard way, it ends up saying something like that the number of integral points, so I guess this is kind of an Archimedean analog of what we're saying here, but it would say something like the number of Archimedean, the number of integral points in a ball of radius one is basically big O of one. So it's not a very impressive sounding statement, but we're kind of trying to prove some kind of distorted analog of that here. That's roughly what we're looking at. And um, so I was hoping maybe to end, end a bit early, but um, so and, and I'll have time. So I'll, I'll, I'll say at least like kind of the input of the proof for the fiber bound. So, this, so, so the main thing that we use in the end is that if we have two elements in our Eichler order, then we can take their commutator and the determinant of that commutator always satisfies a very strong congruence condition. So maybe it's simplest to just look at this example here where we have the matrix algebra and our Eichel order consists of things like this that are upper triangular mod V. Well, when you take the commutator of two things that are upper triangular mod V, the result will be null potent mod V. And it's pretty easy to see that a determinant of anything here is divisible by V. So this turns out to be a pretty robust observation. And the way we apply this is to show that if we have one element in the set that we're trying to bound, say gamma one, then all of the products that we get from other elements in that same set actually lie in some set of cardinality one. So let's just say set S of cardinality one that contains all these products. So in some sense, we're using one element and then this kind of strong condition on the commutator with any other element to eventually show that those other elements have their products with a given element highly constrained. And hence those other elements in turn are quite constrained. Um, so um, yeah, I have a final slide that just gives the argument for anyone who really wants to see kind of the details of what we do. It's, it's quite a simple argument at the end of the day. Um, but I thought just I would, I would conclude um, now just by summarizing saying that, yeah, we, we improved on these bounds in the little aspect using fourth moments over families studied by uh, norms of theta functions and counting problems. And then it's worth just remarking that it's, it is still open to improve upon this Ivani Sarnak bound in the eigenvalue aspect. And we don't even know how to actually improve any, improve upon the trivial bound in that aspect using this method. And with that, I will thank you guys for your time and uh, conclude.